my name is Moni. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And today we have another top 10 for you. This time it is a topic that was voted on by our wonderful Patreon community. And it is our top 10 board games that we are never getting rid of. That's right. Our last uh, top 10 was kind of the opposite of this. The games that we regretted getting rid of. So we decided let's revisit the topic and have no regrets. Yeah, we don't want to regret these things anymore. No. <laughs> And so our list today is not going to be our top 10 favorite games, right? It's very tempting to just include all of your favorite games because you clearly don't want to get rid of them. Right. But it's going to be more so along the lines of games that are maybe out of print or games that we just kind of hold dear in our collection yeah. that we know we're never going to get rid of. That's right. But before we get started, we do want to mention that this episode is sponsored by a coffee company called Many Worlds Tavern. So we want to take a minute and tell you about them. Many Worlds Tavern is an online coffee company that makes coffee for game night. Mm -hmm. They have four different flavors, including a decaf if you don't drink a whole lot of caffeine, and they each come to your door beautifully packaged. And so today we are drinking... The Great Old One. It's the uh, the flavor that I like the most. It's a bold flavor, more rich, uh, darker roast, uh, which is my, my style. And so my favorite of their flavors is, I'm going to let you know in a future episode. For each flavor, they have different grind sizes. So if you want a whole bean, uh, they have that option. We personally got the drip because mm -hmm. It's just easier and convenient. Uh, if you do French roast, there's also options for that. So there's a couple different options that you have within those different flavors. Also, they do contribute and donate a one dollar from every bag sold to a gaming-related uh, charity, and so mm -hmm. we think that's really great. A gaming-related nonprofit. That's right. And so, if you'd like to know more information about their company as well as the products that they sell, you can visit them over at their website, which is ManyWorldsTavern.com. We've included a link to their website in the description below, as well as a discount code for 10% off for the first 100 people who use it. So, thank you so much to Many Worlds Tavern. All right, and I think we're ready to begin. Let's do it. And by the way, we did take some pictures just so you have an idea as to what the game looks like, but in some of these photos, the game isn't completely set up. So just uh, FYI. <laughs> Let's go first. Yeah, okay. So uh, most of our top tens, we always start with a runner-up. So this is like no other. We are going to start with my runner-up. And uh, this is a game that uh, is designed by Carlo Lavezzi, and it's published by Lookout Games. It came out in 2014. And this game is a runner-up because it is actually quite widely available <laughs> at a fairly affordable price. You just love it. It's just a game that I really enjoy. <laughs> and it is uh, rated very low on BGG, actually, it's 6.3. Uh, but it is Johari. And this is a hand management game where you're kind of doing simultaneous action selection. Uh, and essentially, it is a set collection game of these different gems, and it's your very typical Euro theme, collecting mm -hmm. gems so that you can score points. Yeah, the action selection part of it is is pretty interesting, because mm -hmm. everybody has the same hand of cards, and yep. your cards are the different actions that you can take during the game. Right. And I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, you choose a morning, noon, and night action, action yeah. and then you resolve them in player order, but you don't know what cards other people are going to choose, and sometimes mm -hmm. that can affect... What happens on your turn? Yeah, and right? sometimes depending on the time of day that you uh, you play a card, mm -hmm. some of the cards have a cost associated with it. So if you play it early, uh, it, you have to pay the, the cost. Sometimes later on, if you can hold off and play it later, then it's cheap or free. But then sometimes the things that you need to get done get taken up by your other players. Right. So And so for me, this game is best at only four players. It's a two to four player game. We've tried it at three, and I don't think I would ever play it at two. Uh, the full complement of four, that stress of seeing things that you want at mm -hmm. the right time and trying to outwit your opponents as to how you're going to get these resources, I think a four player game is the only way to play mm -hmm. this game. And getting like the real gems versus the fake gems? Yeah, yes, it's interesting. Right. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's Johari, and that's my runner-up. All right, so my runner-up is a four-player only game, which is funny because you said you would only <laughs> yeah. play that game at four. This game, you are only allowed to play it at four. That's right. And uh, it's designed by Dominique Bowden and published by Istari Games and Asmodee in 2014. And it's a game called Witness. Yeah. So I really love this game. I think I've talked about it before in a, in a previous video, uh -huh, but yeah. obviously we haven't played it on our channel because you, you can't need be four, done. four people to play it. Yep. And it's basically a telephone, but you're solving a crime and it's cooperative. That's right. <laughs> it's uh, really neat. And this game is notoriously out of print. Uh, it's probably out of print right now. Probably, yeah. Right? And so I just happened to get it you know, from a friend who was getting rid of his copy and I just get really, really lucky. But it's so fun and it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, this one's interesting. Uh, this one has basically a, a case book where everybody has their own individual uh, piece of the puzzle of the case. And so you're going to be communicating with different teammates and trying to basically play the telephone game saying, 
things like the red car went north and then maybe somebody else has the yellow car went south. And then so things start to get kind of blurred and like the lines kind of just get a little bit uh, fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And so it gets, it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as the game goes on, you have to then take information that another person told you and then you have to now pass it along, still remembering yeah. all the other things that uh, have been told to you. So it gets pretty chaotic. Yes, it's really hard, it is hard. <laughs> because, you know, depending on how much you trust your friends, yeah. it, it can be really, really hard, but it's hilarious. The best so. part is whenever you hear conflicting things, like the yellow car went north and mm -hmm. somebody's like, the yellow car went south. And you're right. like, oh, gosh. And some of the cases can be really, really <laughs> difficult. Like I know somewhere in there, there is a case about a deck of cards oh, yeah. and people have like different suits and That's stuff right. in their case books. And it, that, that one I'm pretty sure is uh, really difficult. Yeah. But the reason why it is a runner up for me is because it is expendable, I suppose. Like you, you do all the cases and then you know all the answers. That's right. So at that point, you wouldn't be able to really play anymore if you remember the answers. So it's not expendable yet for us because we have quite a bit to still play. Yeah. But you need to play with four people. So, so that is Witness, my runner up. Okay, so now moving into the numbered games. Uh, this is my number 10 game. It is a game designed by Matt Greenleaf and published by Piggy Bank Games. Came out in 2017. And this one, I believe, is out of print. You might be able to get it on Piggy Bank's uh, website. And it is a game called Jack's Friends. This is uh, a very interesting game. It's a very short game. It mm -hmm. plays two to six players, and it's a one versus many. And it's essentially a uh, Jack and the Beanstalk themed game where mm -hmm. uh, one player is playing as the giant and the other people are playing as Jack and Jack's friends. Mm -hmm. um, kind of just nobody's no named people. But uh, yeah, it's just the theme. <laughs> essentially what you're trying to do if you are the giant is you're trying to guess where other players are going to be trying to go because those players, the people who are all on the same team, mm -hmm. are going to be trying to gather different ingredients and try to complete different tasks before the game runs out. Yeah, so I believe there are four different locations that are mm -hmm. set up in the middle of the table, yep. and everybody has a hand of cards that all correspond to the different locations. Yep. And so if you're on the cooperative team, you're going to play a card from your hand simultaneously. Trying to, to gather the to resources. Yeah, the resources at the location, exactly. And mm -hmm. if you're the giant, then you're going to try to catch as many of these people by playing a location card that you think they're going to go to. Yeah, because a lot of times uh, you, as a giant, mm -hmm. you know what they need to, to, to be successful and to win. So sometimes if there's only one piece of meat somewhere and they really need that piece of meat you're like well i'm gonna try to catch you right but then it can get kind of in this meta game kind of thing where you're trying to outthink your opponents and they're you know you think maybe mm -hmm. okay that's too easy maybe they're not gonna go there maybe yeah. they're gonna try to zig when when i'm trying to zag and then you get caught up in, in, right. in making bad decisions and so uh, i don't know it's 15 minutes i really enjoy it uh it he plays, loves this game <laughs> yeah it plays really well uh this is uh jack's friends that's yeah. my number 10 Okay, so my number 10 is actually a social deduction game. And this is my favorite social deduction game of all time. It is a game that's designed by Alan Girding and Sean McCoy and published by Tuesday Night Games in 2013. And it is called Two Rooms and a Boom. So Ooh. this game requires a lot of people. It does, yes. Um, and uh, But it's so fun because the, the whole premise of this is everybody is split up into two different groups and ideally you're put into two different rooms. Typically two different teams, yes. Yes. And you're, you're, we're thinking like 15 to 30 players. Like it's a large group of people typically. Yeah, I, I think a good solid number is, you want even numbers typically. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a good solid number is 14 or greater. Mm. Yeah. That's my personal opinion. And so each player is given a card, and that is your identity. You're either going to be on the red team or the blue team, and each room is going to have a mix of both red team and blue team people. Yep. And in addition, depending on how difficult you make the game, you can also have specific roles. So on the blue team, there's always going to be a president. president yep. And on the red, t red team, there's always going to be a bomber. At the start of the game, you don't know who's on your team. Right. And so once the timer starts, because you play this over several rounds, each lasting a certain amount of time, and once the timer starts, you go up to somebody and you say, hey, do you want a color share or do you want a full card share? And you're basically asking them, do you want to reveal some of your identity to me so that I can start finding out who's on my team? Exactly, yep. Because... At the end of each round, you're going to exchange people, like one person, depending on the number of players. Yeah, in the room, there will be somebody that's designated the leader of the mm -hmm. room, and that person is going to decide uh, how many people are going to be sent from that room and be moved over to the other room while the same thing is happening in the other room and people are going to be coming it's, back. It's a set number of people, but right. they decide who is going to move. Exactly. And so the way that it works is if you're on the blue team, at the very, very end of the game, you want it to be that the president and the bomber are in two separate rooms. That's right, yep. If you're on the red team, you're trying to get the bomber 
Palmer to be with the president at the end of the game that's because right. that's kind of like their evil, terrible plan. Right, right. right. <laughs> and there's a bunch of different characters that mm-hmm. uh, that kind of spoil things or make things a little bit more messy and a yes. little bit uh, curious. Um, mm-hmm. For me, this I I enjoy this game, uh, but it's a game that I only want to play about two or three rounds at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Monique can play long, long sessions. It's so of, fun. Yeah. <laughs> so after after about the second or third game, I'm ready to move on. But mm-hmm. I know you really love it. There are a lot of different roles that you can play as, and that's what makes it really interesting. It gets really political. You know, you you start like scabbing people in the mm-hmm. rooms, like pretending you're on one team when you're really on the other. Right. And uh, in in games with higher player counts, there are also gray neutral roles that are not part of the red team or the blue team at all. And they just have their own private win condition. That's if you're right. Romeo, yeah. you want to find Juliet and you want to end up in the same room as a bomber That's by right. the end of the game. That's right. So that makes it even more political. And I don't know. I think it's just, it's hilarious. It's really, really fun. It's a great icebreaker. Like if you have a company or something and, mm-hmm. and you just want to do an icebreaker, this is a perfect game for that. Um, and it is on my list because I have no idea if this is ever going to go out of print. It feels like it could potentially. I had no idea it and came out in 2013. Yeah, yeah. it's been about for, for a while. For a while. But I love it so much. That is Two Rooms and a Boom, my number 10. Okay, my number nine. This is a game that is, uh, I think, the oldest on my list. It is designed by Klaus mm-hmm. Teuber, and it's published by Jumbo. And if you're not familiar with Klaus Teuber, uh, he did Catan, which this game is not Catan, <laughs> and oh. it is a game called Adele for Flift, a.k.a. Hoity Toity. Uh, this is a very silly game. Uh, it mm-hmm. is a three to six player game. I think I like it best at five. Um, and essentially what you're going to be doing is you're trying to steal art <laughs> and uh, not get caught doing it. And you're essentially trying to race around the board and get to the end. Mm -hmm. That's the most bare bones way I can describe it. Uh, But it's really interesting because uh, when I say you're trying not to get caught is other teammates or sorry, not other teammates. Other opponents can play certain uh, detective cards and try to catch you when you're in the act of trying to steal cards. Essentially, what you're trying to do in order to move and progress as far along on the track as possible is you're trying to get these different art pieces that go in kind of ascending order in the in the alphabet. So you want A, B, C, D. Uh, and the bigger and better that you can kind of showcase, the further along you're going to go. Um, it's it's a pretty interesting game. I played it recently at the local convention. It's been a while since I had played it. And that kind of solidified that, yeah, I want to keep this game for a very, very long time. Yeah, it's been a really long time since I played this. So, like, as you're explaining it, I'm trying to remember how this game is played. I remember there being a rock, paper, scissors kind of mechanic. Yes. Right? Uh, because uh, each player has, like, a hand of location cards. Yep. Or it's only, like, three or something. You simultaneously select what you're going to do. Yeah, room. so it's like you can either showcase your art, mm-hmm. uh, you can either rob the art that other people are showcasing, or you can play a detective card and try to catch a robber. So sometimes if you are mm-hmm. lacking in that ascending order of these uh, different letters of the different art, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm like, I know Monique has some B and she's going to play a B card, then I'm going to try to play the robber. But other people know that. That, hey, there's, there's going to be some good stuff showing uh-huh. up here. So they're going to want to play the detective and kind of catch you. So uh, it's, uh, it, it gets very kind of tricky as to like when. It the, sounds the ridiculous, it is but really it's ridiculous. a really fun game. <laughs> and it's fun to play with a, you know, a group of people who are like really into it also. Yeah. Um, the rock, paper, scissors mechanic is funny because you're trying to you're trying to steal the art without mm-hmm. getting caught, essentially. Yep. And like that timing of when people do that and the way that the scoring works is you're just on a board and you're trying to race around the perimeter of yeah. it. And depending on where you are in these little thresholds on the board de- determines how far, how far along you, move, yeah. you move forward. So it's really interesting. Yeah. Also, there's a good catch-up mechanism. So you're never truly out of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're in last place and you're able to showcase your art, you mm-hmm. get to go and push a lot further than yeah. if you're in first place showing really nice art. So uh, that's my number nine. Uh, I will call it by its American name, Hoity Toity. <laughs> it's a good pick. Okay. So my number nine is also an older-ish game. It's not the oldest one on my list, but it's it's up there. Mm-hmm. And it's actually a card game that was designed by Naoki Homa and published by Z-Man Games in 2007. And it's called Parade. This is a so, great game. <laughs> I really enjoy this I one. I really love this game. Yeah. It is a card game mm-hmm. and uh, it plays a lot of people. I believe you can play, what, six? I think you can play six. Yeah. But I think the sweet spot is about four or five, yeah. It plays really well at higher player counts. And one of the reasons why, or the main reason why this is on my list, is because the first time we played it, 
it was out of print. Yeah. So we went everywhere in the world looking for this game. We literally went to Essen, Spiel, yeah. and looked in every stall. Every because... single booth. Because there's a lot of resale games over there. Yes. And I tried and tried and tried to find it back in, I think, 2017. Yeah, there are out. a ton of games that you can find over there that, that you can't really readily find here. Mm -hmm. And so we, we asked. We went to the Z-Men Games booth and asked them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> when they were releasing this again. And they didn't know. They said they weren't going to. But I guess it is back in print. Yeah, so now it's back in print. Yeah. So if you're interested in this game, you can get it. Go get it. Because I don't know if it's going to go out of print again, and I'll have to suffer that. Yes. So we actually have two copies of it. And the premise of it, the reason why it's called Parade, it's Alice in Wonderland themed. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, not super thematic. It's not but thematic at all. It's just all the cards are in that kind of illustration. And at the start of the game, you're going to have a line of these cards, and they're all numbered, I think, 1 through... Uh, 0 through 10. Oh, 0 through 10. Okay. And there's six different suits. Yes. And so you're, you line them up in a starting parade, mm -hmm. and on your turn, you have to choose a card to play to the end of the parade. And depending on a certain set number of rules that are in the game, uh, you're going to be required to take cards out of the parade mm -hmm. into your scoring area. And the, the parameters are like... Every card that's of the same color as the card that you played or of the a value equal to or less than the card that you played. I don't, I don't remember the exact rules. That's exactly it, actually. But, but you're required to take them into your scoring pile, and that's bad because at the end of the game, whoever has the lowest score that's wins. Right. Yep. But there's a whole meta part to it where if you are the person at the end of the game who has the most number of cards in a certain color or suit, then you get to flip them all over, and now instead of the, the sum of their values, they're each just worth one point. That's right, yeah. So it gets really funny because you're trying to uh, you're trying to mess up each other's scores. Yeah. <laughs> that you're, part's hilarious. There's, there's a bit of card counting going on because mm -hmm. uh, essentially the game uh, plays until the entire deck typically runs out. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way the game ends is if somebody has collected every single color, but nobody's going to want to do that because right. they don't want to score points. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially you're card counting and, and kind of trying to figure out, like, can I... Can I take this blue card? I think I'm leading in blue. Right. I think I can afford this. And then all of a sudden you see a bunch of other blue cards come out and yeah. somebody else takes more blue and you're like, oh, oh, dude, like, <laughs> what, what am I going to do here? Like, Or if I'm you stuck. like take two really high valued cards and now I have a six and a four and now I'm, I have a score of a 10, I yeah. might as well try to get the rest of that, you keep going, that yeah. suit so that they're all just worth one point but each. But everybody else knows that, that you're going to be trying to gun for it. So yeah. they're trying to like siphon them off right. a little, little bit. So little. it's really interesting. Yeah. It's a very good game. Highly recommend Parade. Yeah, one of my favorites. My number nine. Okay, moving on. We have my number eight game. This is a game that is designed by Stefan Feld and published by Alea and Ravensburger. And it came out in 2011, and I think a lot of people probably know exactly what it is based off of that. And it is <laughs> The Castles of Burgundy. This is a fantastic Euro game. Uh, it is a game where you're basically trying to build out an estate uh, with these yeah. different hex tiles. Uh, there's no theme at all in this game, but it's exactly what I'm looking for in a Euro game. Uh, there is some quick, uh, easy decision uh, points that you have to make. The game can go pretty quickly. Um, how else do you describe this? What would you say? Well, it's that's exactly right. You are yeah. building out your estates. Everybody yeah. has their own like player mat that has this right. uh, map that's color coded. And they can be and, asymmetric. Uh, each of these spaces has a certain pip value on a die. And so on your turn, you roll your, your dice. And depending on the values of your die, you get to take certain actions. And those actions are like taking these uh, tiles from the main board to put into your holding area yep. so that you cannot take them directly from the main board to your actual estate. estate. Yeah. Or you can use a die to take a tile that you've taken previously and put it into your estate. And then depending on the category of tile, like for example, the animal tiles, they just score you points, but they'll score you one point per animal of all the same type as, right. that are in the same section. Mm -hmm. Different building tiles let you take a different action depending on the type of building. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that you can do in the game and it is pure Euro, but it's very good. Yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoy it. There's uh, mm -hmm. expansions to it. Uh, there was a new version of this. Uh, I honestly haven't even seen it. There, I, I personally like this particular look for this one. Um, I think I saw the, the some pictures of the, the, the reprint of this one, and mm -hmm. I wasn't a big fan of it, so that's that's exactly why I think I want to keep this one forever. Mm -hmm. And that is my number eight. That is the Castles of Burgundy. My number eight is a deduction with Euro worker placement aspects to mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. And it is a game designed by Matus Kotri and published by CGE in 2014, and it's called Alchemists. This is a game that we covered on our channel, yeah. and it is one of my favorite uh, deduction, like logic games. Mm -hmm. Even though it's there's a strong deduction component to it, but it's not the entire game. Right. There's a lot more that you can do. And so, if you're not familiar with this game, you are playing the role of an alchemist. 
and you're trying to follow the scientific method. You're, you have all these different alchemical tokens that you're trying to figure out their DNA. By mixing different ingredients together. Yeah, by yeah. making potions, you're mixing different ingredients together via an app for your phone. You also have a sheet where you're taking notes and you're kind of crossing things off like clue style, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but there's also this main board where you're going around and uh, taking actions. You're placing your worker out to take actions. It's a true actions. worker placement uh, yeah. style game in that sense. Right. True worker placement. You're taking actions to pick up more ingredients, to um, test ingredients on yourself or on a student, or you're, you're purchasing things from the store. And then you're also publishing theories, which mm -hmm. is one of the main points of the game. And that's right. how you score the most amount of points, right? By, by doing stuff like that. And if you see somebody's published a theory, you also have the ability to debunk their theory. Right. If you think that, oh, no, Monique was taking to guess there she was yeah. swinging for the fences and she's wrong <laughs> i think i can debunk this thing and those are really awesome moments or when you realize yeah. that your notes are completely wrong and yeah. you just kind of go based off of what other people have been answering sometimes you guess <laughs> on a 50 50 coin flip because yeah. the pressure's on and uh and sometimes you get burned but uh that's part of the game and you can actually uh debunk yourself yes uh, so that that is a possibility and that experience is just really fun mm -hmm. um i think the game is really well done and it was one of the the first i guess Climbing into the heavier zone of games when I first started yeah. into the hobby because we first got into it around 2015 mm -hmm. and this game had just come out the year before and it has this beautiful table presence because everybody has their own kind of like laboratory desk that's really this like cardboard this mechanism yeah, yeah this thing that you have to set up yeah and uh, it's a lot of fun and I don't know if this one's ever going to go out of print I feel like it might for that reason I got to hold on to this for dear life it that is, is Alchemist. Mm -hmm. Okay, my number seven, this is a game that came out back in 2018, and we actually picked it up at Essen uh, when we went there, and it is designed by Stefan mm -hmm. Alexander and published by Catch-Up Games. It's a card game called Q-Birds. Uh, <laughs> essentially, what uh, you're trying to do in this game is uh, do a set collection of different bird species, uh, and they all have this kind of cube art style uh, that I was very, very fond of the first time I ever saw it. Uh, this is a game that actually Monique uh, was most interested in, right? Yes. When She's the one that kind of brought me to the booth and said, it's hey, so we got to check out this game. Uh, she saw it on the SM preview list, mm -hmm. and uh, I instantly uh, really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. So this is a game that I had initially seen on that preview list, and I wrote it down, and I was like, we, we, should, we should play it. You mm -hmm. know, this is probably going to be an easy one to demo because it's so quick. But every single time we went to that area, there were so many people who were interested in it. So we finally got to play it once, you know, towards the end of the convention. And there was like auto buy. Yeah. For, for auto, him. Yeah. And so essentially what ha what's happening here is everybody has a hand of cards. And in the middle, there's a grid of bird cards. And it's set up like three by four. Mm -hmm. And the object of the game is to collect either one of all of the different species. I think there's seven of them. Mm -hmm. Or two different species types, but three cards each right. of each type. Right, right. Each bird card has a number at the top, like a smaller number and a larger number. And that tells you how many of that specific species that you need to collect in order to fulfill either a small flock or a large flock. Because right. if you fulfill a small flock, you get to keep one of those cards. Mm -hmm. If you do a large flock, then you get to keep two of those cards. Yes. Again, trying to be mindful of the end game trigger. Yes, exactly. It's, it's essentially a race, the game. And so on your turn, you play a card to one of the rows. And uh, say I play a toucan, and there's another toucan in that row. Then because I played the same bird card, every single bird card in between the two toucans, I get to pick up into right. my hand. Mm -hmm. And so that's that becomes, you know, strategic uh, to try to pick up the most of one type of species of bird so I can create these flocks. And it's really cute. Uh, so it gets very, very interesting. There's a mid-game point where uh, everybody flushes their cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gets really, really kind of antsy because you don't want to be uh, caught, you know, collecting this huge flock yeah. and unable to uh, to get them to down on the on the table. Discard all the toucans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this one's on my list because uh, I don't think it ever came into the U.S. Uh, I think we got really lucky by going there and just finding this game randomly. And we also haven't looked, so maybe it's in the U.S. I'm not too sure. But, but yeah, for that reason, it is staying in the collection. And that is my number seven, Q-Birds. My number seven is the oldest game on my list. <laughs> we have come to that game, and we've spoken about it before uh -huh. in one of our top tens, actually. It's a game designed by Klaus Jürgen Verde and published by Mayfair and Amigo in 2004. And it's called The Downfall of Pompeii. Um, I love this game. I think that it is, it's probably going to go out of print. I don't know. I just see a game look, that looks like this yeah. and that I know how long ago it was made. And I know this has got to be going out of print at some point in the near future. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not familiar with this game, you are, it's, it, you know, it's centered around the downfall of Pompeii and the volcano that erupted. And uh, you're essentially spending the first half of the game trying to fill the city with people. 
of your own little cylindrical discs. Uh -huh. And then at some point, the volcano erupts, and then you spend the, the second half of the game <laughs> spreading the lava because the players yeah. get to kind of decide, kind of, get to decide where the, fl the lava is going to flow. Right. You definitely want to place the lava on top of your opponent's little cylinders because yeah. every time you do that, you get to throw their people into the volcano, which sounds terrible, but is actually really satisfying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Essentially, what you, what the, the, the person who wins the game is the person that can get the most of their people out yes. by the end of the game. Yeah. And so uh, you're you're trying to do in the first half of the game, you're trying to set yourself up cl as close to the exits as possible. And then in the second half of the game, you're trying to avoid the lava and try to get out as fast as possible. Right. So it is an entertaining game. You really, really are trying to save as many people as you can. Mm -hmm. That is the object of the game. It's a game that we learned when we first started getting into the hobby and we still enjoy to this day. I even want to replace the deck of cards that come with it because yeah. they're so worn now. They are. And, uh, and I think it was recently on sale on Amazon, by the way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that is my number seven, the downfall of Pompeii. Okay, so my number six, this is a game that's designed by Xavier Georges and published by Pearl Games, and it came out back in 2012. And it was out of print for a very, very, very long time until very recently, and it is called Ginkopolis. So we actually covered this game on our channel, and uh, the first time I ever played it, we were at a local convention, and a friend taught it to us. It is a very wonky game to teach, yeah. <laughs> uh, especially on the fly at a convention. It's complicated. It's, uh, yeah, it's complicated, but once you know how to play it, that's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But yeah. um Played it, I really enjoyed it, and I was like, oh, I gotta look up this game. And sure enough, I looked it up, and it was super out of print for years and years yeah. and years. So like I said, when we uh, went to Essen, uh, we tried to go look for other games, and I actually got a copy from somebody in Germany selling their copy. Uh, it's a German copy, but it was language independent, mm -hmm. and it still is to this day. And so um, I got that, and I bought it, and I it sat on the shelf for like two years because we didn't get to play it. But when they did a re-release, we had the fortunate opportunity to cover it on a channel, so if you are interested in it, We'll leave a link up here. Um, and I struggle with describing this game, so I'm really hoping that you can help me out here. Oh, uh, it's a city builder. Okay, yeah. So there are tiles in the middle of the table, and it's a, it's, it's actually a drafting game. You yeah. have a hand of, of, I believe, four cards. Four cards, yep. And you choose a card, and everybody simultaneously selects a card from their hand to play, and you're playing this card to either build the city outwards, like to make it wider. Lateral, yeah. Or to, to build up. And That's if you build right. up, then you get to place your, uh, your little cylinder possession um, markers, I guess yeah, you could say. Yeah, because it's an area control game in the end. Mm -hmm. To show that that you t are in control of that stack of tiles. That's right. Uh, or you can also use these cards to gain resources. There's like a slight engine building component to it that's mm -hmm. really fun. And at the very, very end of the game, you're going to have essentially districts of tiles. They're essentially tiles of all the same color. Color, yeah. And uh, there are going to be multiple people that are claiming ownership to these districts, but whoever has the most number of uh, markers gets points equal to However many markers, the markers there are there. Yeah. on the on the entire uh, district, That's regardless right. of who owns them, and so there's a lot of like there's a lot of metagaming in this, a lot of like little psychology of like, well, I want to place my marker over there, but that's just gonna make that district larger yeah. for the person who's gonna win it, and it's not gonna be me. So I'm just giving this person points. There's, right? a, there's also the ability to cut off districts, so mm -hmm. uh, you can change the color of the district or. Uh, Essentially, the district, it's all one district if everything is contiguous next to each other. Mm -hmm. So there's a way and a mechanism where you can overbuild on something. So right. let's say it's a big blue district. I can now put a big, uh, or sorry, a red district tile on top of it, basically segregating the two blue districts. So that person that was really owning mm -hmm. that gets kind of frustrated. And it's like, oh, man. Maybe like, they'll switch a room. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a very offensive and defensive game. And because mm -hmm. it is drafting, you kind of know what kind of cards are in circulation for the round. Yes. Uh, so you kind of have to be, be very, very vigilant and careful as to what you do. And it plays well at two. It does play well at two. Uh, I think I did like it better at uh, three, was it? I think three kind of kept everyone a little bit more in check. Yeah, and just higher the than that, a little more it becomes a lot more chaotic. It does, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's very, very strategic at two. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, so that is my number six, Ginkopolis. Okay, moving on to my number six. This is a game that is designed by Muneyuki Yokuchi and published by Ninja Star Games in 2018. This is another card game, because I really, I guess I really like card we games. We like card games, yeah. And uh, it's called 
Yokai Septa. Mm-hmm. So this is a game that we talked about before, I think. I think, on, I think like it. the top 10 on that we did with Rado on his channel. Rado I, runs through. We probably did talk about this, yeah. Yes. And so this is a trick-taking game. But uh, the thing that's neat about it is there are seven different suits in the game and they're color-coded. And each suit has values that range, but they're cascading ranges. Mm-hmm. So if one goes from one to seven, the next one, the next suit will go from two, two to eight, eight three, three to nine, nine, like that. And so everybody, every suit only has one value in common and those are the sevens and mm-hmm. so the object of the game is to win a certain number of these sevens by winning tricks right. with sevens in them and so in a three-player game it's it's just all competitive in a four-player game you're a team based and that's my team favorite way to play because yeah. you play with your the person that's in front of you against the two people mm-hmm. the other two people in the game you're not allowed to communicate obviously what's in your hand and so that that's yeah, really funny like when you are able to bamboozle your opponents yeah. and win all the sevens in, in one go or something it's yeah really fun. in the team team game you have to win uh four tricks that encompass sevens or or at least four sevens you have to win mm-hmm. before you win seven total tricks so right so it's not four tricks that have seven right, you just yeah. have to win four, four seven sevens. cards so they can all be in the same trick if you're able to get that yes. somehow but you can also make your opponents lose if they win seven tricks without gaining those four sevens. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of this teeter-totter where it, maybe uh, the people you're playing against have won two sevens really early. Then mm-hmm. you're like, all right, look, we, we just needed them to win a bunch of tricks but not get any more sevens. Right. So you can try to make them bust. Mm-hmm. And so, so. Uh, it gets it gets pretty interesting. Uh, there is a trump suit in the game, so it does keep things kind of a little bit fresh. Mm-hmm. And then there's also a super trump, which kind of uh, you always have to be aware of mm-hmm. uh, as to you know, when that can come out and can right. hurt you. And you know who the person is who has the super trump. So right. that's just interesting. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that is another really neat uh, kind of small card game, trick-taking game. You know, these are really fun to just get, get in and out of anyway. And this is probably one of my favorite trick-taking games I think that time. is my favorite trick-taking game. Yeah. yeah. Yokai set that. And the reason why this is on my list is because it is by an, in, an indie publisher. A good one, Ninja Star Games, is awesome. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it's not easily, you know, readily available in, like, local stores and stuff. Right. So it is a game that I hold dear. Okay, my number five. This is uh, a game that is uh, we, something we covered on our channel. Uh, it came out in 2018, and it's published by Kayenta Games and designed by Dan Halligan. And this is a game called Obsession. Yeah. Okay, this is a game that I did not expect to enjoy, but I <laughs> really enjoy this one. I didn't, ex- I didn't know that you were going to enjoy it that much either. Yeah. It really loves Obsession. Yeah, this is a uh, a English courtship game, technically. Yes, in the, uh, in the Victorian, Victorian era. era. This is how people got together. This is how they dated back <laughs> this then. This is how they dated, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and so essentially you're trying to build out your estate and try to be the most uh, affluent, I guess, uh, showboat. <laughs> and you're trying yeah. to marry off uh, somebody from your family to a wealthy uh, gal or a wealthy guy. And so this is a game that we covered on a channel, by the way, but essentially it is a tableau builder. Mm-hmm. You know, you have these tiles that all represent the different activities or whatever you're doing with these people who are dating. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on your turn, you're going to activate one of them that are in front of you. And the tiles have a certain uh, number of requirements, mm-hmm. either guests for, that you have to play uh, from your hand or or workers. And they give you certain benefits like additional guests that you can draw cards from or uh, money, money because yeah. you need money in order to buy more of these tiles to put out in front of you. And those are essentially how you score points mm-hmm. because the tiles are worth a certain number of points. And it's just this big like engine building, uh, tableau building game, and it's a very, it's quite the efficiency engine, Mm -hmm. and it's really clever. Um, Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I really like the game, too. It's really neat. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I I was not expecting to like this one as much as I did, but once we we played it a bunch to get ready for our filming of it, uh, I really fell in love with it. I think it's a fantastic game. Uh, This one is staying in the collection because, first of all, I do like the game a lot, and also, uh, from what I understand, it is a little bit hard to get right now, so... um, That's a good choice. Yep, so that is my number five. That is Obsession. All right, so my number five is another card game. <laughs> I guess they're all card games. And it's a, it's, a, it's kind of a new one, designed by Costa and Rolla and uh, published by Pythagoras in 2020, which was just last year. Uh, if you've seen some of our videos from last year, I've raved about this game so much, mm-hmm. and it's called Cafe. So this is prob- there's probably, it's probably pretty obvious why this game is on my list. Uh, it's really, really hard to get, especially in North America. And I really loved it. It was one of the favorite, my favorite games that came out last year. Mm-hmm. And it's essentially, if you're not familiar with it, it's essentially a game about uh, the whole production of making coffee. Yeah. Like you get the beans, you dry them, you roast them, and then you send them off to the different, to the different stores. Cafes. And you, 
you're just trying to uh, fulfill these orders and you, you really are just trying to be efficient. It's yeah, another one of those efficiency engines. I, I was just about to say, yeah, yeah, just like talking about obsession, this is another efficiency game for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's definitely something that we both really uh, value in games, mm -hmm. that kind of like efficiency engine, feeling like you're trying to create something efficiently. Right. And uh, I always feel like every time I play it, I'm not being efficient. Yeah. <laughs> and like, oh, I always feel like halfway through the game, okay, if I try it again, now I know exactly what to do, and then I'll try it again, and I don't do that. Yeah, the challenge, <laughs> the challenge comes in uh, the way the cards are set up. They're set up in these like uh, two by three grids mm -hmm. in, in, in which there's these different action types are listed on the cards. Yes. And the rule is when you take a card and you add it to your business empire, you essentially have to cover up at least some something else. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, you never quite know what the next set of cards you're going to get is. So maybe you're building something and then another card comes out and you're like, oh, that would have been better if I didn't put this <laughs> card here. And there's definitely that abstract component yeah. where you're just trying to, and that is where the efficiency part comes into right. play. I really, really love this game. I really like the theme as well. And so that is my number five, Cafe. Okay, we are getting down to it. Uh, my number four, mm -hmm. this is a game that is designed by Martin Wallace. It was uh, reprinted by a company called Roxley. And it's technically originally uh, designed back in 2007. And this is Brass. And you're going to ask me which one. It is Brass Lancashire. <laughs> but the uh, read, the read, The redone. This yeah. particular one from Roxley. Right. Um, I, I personally prefer this one over Brass Birmingham. I know a ton of people that like Birmingham better. Uh, I just kind of like this design because I think there's just a little bit less you have to keep track of. Not that I don't want to keep track of the beer in Birmingham. I like it. I like just kind of what you're trying to do by getting things to the ports uh, in this one. So in this game, you have a hand of cards that correspond to different city locations that you see on the board, mm -hmm. as well as different industries. And on your turn, you're going to be able to take two actions. So one of the actions, uh, you can play a card and build up an industry in a certain city, or you can build uh, different canals if you're in the canal era, which is the first half, or rails if you're in the second half. And essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to build up different linking um, industries and trying to ship goods from one location out to the ports. And you're trying to do it in the most efficient way as possible, like most uh, Euro games. Yeah. Um, this game is interesting because there is a loan mechanism where you can take out a loan, which is almost essential, uh, in my opinion. You have to take out at least one loan. I'm sure there's people that do not do it, but <laughs> you got to take the money when you can. I think and, you have to. Yeah. At least one. And uh, my favorite aspect of this game, though, is the turn order sequence. So in this particular game, if you spend the most money in a, in a given round, in the next round, you're going to be going dead last. And if you spend the least amount of money, you're going to be going first. So sometimes you can kind of game things where you take a loan, where you know that next round you're going to make an awesome move and really take up some really, really good real estate. And that is my favorite aspect of this game that I, I really, really enjoy. Um, you have played both. Yes. So this so, is a game that we differ in opinion. Yeah. I am more on the Brass Birmingham side. I guess I could be swayed, but I'm really, really thinking I like Birmingham better. Uh, and this is a highly, highly economic game. This is an economic game. That's what it, it is. is. Yeah. The income and the loans are all very interesting because there's an, there's an income track and depending on the industries that you build out, it'll increase your income. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really important because you need a lot of money in this game because every industry that you put out is expensive and you, you don't just pay for tiles onto the board with money. You also need resources like coal iron. and iron. Yeah, and you have to find a way to get those resources. And uh, both designs are slightly different in a way that, I mean, we, we own both and I, and I don't feel the need to get rid of either yeah. one. The systems know? are the same. It's just in the other one, there's different technologies like there's a, a what's that called? pottery and then there's also beer, which is very... Very important mm -hmm. uh, in the second half of the game yeah. in Brass Birmingham. Uh, that one, I think it kind of muddies it up a little bit for me. And this one is just kind of the design that I was first introduced to. So I think that's why I like this one a little bit more. Not that I wouldn't play Brass Birmingham. I love that game also. But of the two, if I was to keep one forever, <laughs> it'll probably be Brass Lancashire. Ah, so yeah. you would get rid of Birmingham. That's not that I'm going to. The, it's, the, the boxes are pretty thin. Comes out. You know? that's, this is like, if you put both <laughs> of them, it's like one game. Uh, and so that is my number four, Brass Lancashire. Okay, my number four might be a little bit surprising. First of all, this is not a card game. <laughs> it's a bigger game, um, but it is also a game that we have two of. And it's because it's a game designed by Vitala Serta and published by Stronghold Games in 2014. Mm -hmm. And it is 
Kanban, the original version of it. It's yes. Kanban Automotive Revolution. So right. there's Kanban, the driver's edition. Now there's Kanban EV, which we've also re slightly recently reviewed on yes, our channel, right. which is like the bigger Eagle Griffin deluxe version of the game. And right. then there's the original, which is Kanban Automotive Revolution. Mm -hmm. This is the very first uh, Vitalis sort of game that I had ever played. This is the heaviest game that I played in like our first year and a half yeah. of board gaming. And this mm -hmm. is the one that really, really opened my eyes to the world of heavy Euro games. And so this specific copy is is really close to me because of that. You know, I took the rule book. The rule book is all kinds of Tatter. warped, so we're yeah. not going to take it out. Yeah. But but um, I took that with me all over the place because I could not figure out how to play this game, you know, the very first time I read it. Um, and so the reason why this is on our list, even though we have Kanban EV, is because... You know, we get a lot of comments uh, in regards to the sort of games or just like other big box, any kind of large deluxified version of mm -hmm. a game. We get we'll get comments from people who who mention how you know I wish they weren't all this big and expensive and and I, I really I hear you. Yeah. You know those games not only are they expensive but they're, they're huge. huge. They, they take, take up, up a, a huge lot spot right up there. of space and yeah. like if you're going to a game night putting that in a bag like that's you're gonna carry that and yeah. then you're gonna put other games in a bag right. Totally. So this is a nice version of the game that plays essentially the same it does have you know it doesn't look as pretty as ev and it, has, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the expansions that that comes with but if i just want to bring it to a game night and i don't want the hassle of that like large version then i'm bringing this yeah because it's so much smaller and easier and lighter all of the above i i appreciate uh all that game in this little box mm -hmm. not that we don't think those those other big ones are really beautiful it's just oh yeah they're they're gorgeous they just take up so much space yeah. and i i would really appreciate if there was like to almost two versions of, of all those different games. You know? Yeah, for people who have, I mean, that's that's a big ask. That is a big <laughs> it's really ask. expensive to produce. I know, I'm just wishing things. There are people who, yeah, who, who would enjoy that kind of size. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that is my number four. It's Kanban Automotive Revolution, a game that I already own, but a copy that I really, really love. So it's my number four. All right, so moving on, our number three. This is our combined number three. Yeah, so we, did, we do know each one. other's lists ahead of time. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, this is a game that came out in 2016. It is from Stonemeyer Games, and it's published, mm -hmm. by, oh, sorry, published by Stonemeyer Games, designed by Jamie Stegmeyer, and it is Scythe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a great game. I really, really enjoy this one. Yes. Uh, it is a futuristic, but in the past, uh, post World War One, World War Two game. <laughs> Where it's another efficiency engine game where you are asymmetric factions trying to uh, explore different hex tiles, trying to get the resources there so you can build up different infrastructure. You're trying to build mechs, you're trying to go into battle, and uh, sometimes you want to get into the dead center of the factory so you can get as many points and actions <laughs> as you possibly can. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous, <laughs> yes. There's a board. Okay, if you're not familiar with Scythe at all, I think, yeah, we, we played this on our channel once and mm -hmm. we've been meaning to get back to it for like a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get back to it, I promise. This is one of our favorite games and this is a very, very strong, strong position on both of our lists mm -hmm. because we both love it equally as much. We do, yeah. yeah. But if you're not familiar with it, it is a game that has a map and everybody plays as an asymmetric faction, but you can all do pretty much the same uh, in terms of actions it's just the different resources and stuff that that make you different and like and everybody has a special ability but you are essentially you're producing resources you're maneuvering around the map you're going into battle with each other you know you're you're doing all these things in order to try to score the most points in a very euro kind of way and there's an engine building part to it it's really really fun it's a game that we both really love and that this is the game in our entire collection that we've decked out the most. Yeah. It's really funny. This is not the original box for Scythe, if you're not familiar with it. It comes in a different box. This is the legendary, legendary box. box that we just bought because we figured we were going we were gonna to get everything we for the game out, yeah. and put it all in there. And it's actually not in there no, it's empty. right now. <laughs> this is an empty box. Empty. Uh, we just wanted to show it in the box. Because we've never done the transfer. Yeah, we need to do that. Need and it's that. because we, we actually wanted to get an insert for it. it it's this whole thing. We're, we're trying to put a lot of love and time into this game. Um, it's a process. That is our number three side. Okay, so now we're down to our final two. Uh, this one is a game that I, I wasn't sure if I was going to put this one or two, but it definitely belonged in the top uh, two. <laughs> it is published by Stronghold <laughs> okay. Games. came out in 2014, and it is a triple-designed game, so I am going to probably butcher these. I do apologize to all three of you. Uh, Gil de Ore, Nano Bizarro Sentiero, and Paolo Soledad. And it is a game called Panamax. 
Yes. Okay, I really like this game. I hope you like this game, Monique. I'm, I'm I not think you, I think you like it, but I, I picked you... up this game on a uh, on a whim. On a whim, day. yeah. Uh, yeah. it's essentially, uh, you are shipping different goods and cargo through the Panama Canal, and there is a uh, dice selection uh, aspect of the game where it allows you to take certain types of actions. Uh, you can load cargo onto different ships so you can fulfill different contracts, and then you are trying to move these ships through the Panama Canal, and there's an interesting mechanism where... Once a ship is in the canal, it kind of is a blockade there. And so all the ships behind can passively move your ships so you're not taking actions and wasting actions trying to move through that canal. Now, once you get out into open ocean, then they can say, see you later, and then they can continue on. <laughs> but at least you get some some passive movement there. And so also ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to score the most points. Uh, there is an economic aspect of the game where you can invest in other people's companies. So if I see, you know what, Monique is killing it. She is shipping a bunch. I'm going to try to buy some of her stock so that at the end of the game I can get points that way. Um, I think it's a fantastic game. It scales pretty well. Uh, best player count, though, would be four because everybody has their own company. Um, and I think it's a great game. Yeah, so that part is key. The fact that uh, everybody has a company, you know, mm -hmm. that is probably the main aspect of the game. Mm -hmm. You're controlling a company and you're you're buying boats in the name of this company yep. and pushing them and you're trying to you're trying to not let other people succeed, but if you have stock in their company, then you might want them to. Yeah. So you're trying to, you know, that abstract part of I only have a certain number of actions based off of the die that I selected from that middle area. Uh, and am I going to use it? Am I going to select the die that will allow me to move uh, around or through the canal mm -hmm. or allow me to pick up cards or, you know, that, chips, yeah, the that. die selection aspect is interesting. Yeah. And there's also uh, an interesting part where um, there's kind of some pressure at the end of every round. You have to pay upkeep costs for the ships that you have out at sea that have not kind of gotten to their final destination. So there's kind of this mad dash of trying to get into the cheap zone. So like mm -hmm. you could have a ship that's, right. that's sitting in like a in, in a three dollar per per uh, cargo uh, location. You're like, I got one action. I need to get this thing into the cheapest location possible so that I do not have to you know kind of go into the negative or into the red on, on this thing. So. Uh, yeah, I, I really, really enjoy this game. Mm -hmm. I haven't played it in a while, and after talking about it, I really want to get this one back to the table. So. <laughs> it's a very neat application of that theme, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yep. So. so That is my number two. That is Panamax. All right, so my number two is kind of a spoiler. Um, if you're following along on our Uwe Rosenberg series that we have just started, really, uh, we it just is started it, but we, kind the, big, of, the big box games are yeah, just starting. We're yeah. like a game deep <laughs> into sure. the big box, but yeah. love is coming soon. Yes. Uh, it, this is going to be one of the games that, are, that we're going to be covering, and it is a game that I really love. It's one of my favorite games of all time, and this is primarily why it's on the list. I don't necessarily have fears of it going out of print or anything like that. Yeah. I just would never give away a copy of it, especially because there's an insert. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, this is a game designed by Uwe Rosberg. It was published by Z-Man Games in 2016, so fairly recently, and it's called A Feast for Odin. Yes, this and is a dense box. Yeah, it's a large box. Um, the thing about this game is the first, the first time I heard about it, I saw somebody's review, and some, they were mentioning that it has... X number of actions, and that mm -hmm. number was really big. I just don't remember what the number was. And when I heard that initially, I was like, never playing that game. I'm not interested in trying <laughs> to figure out. You're talking about the worker placement menu. Yes, there's, a, there's a worker placement menu. It's, it's yeah. kind of like a sandbox game. You it can is. do a lot in this game. And there there isn't a clear direction as to what is going to win you the game. You mm -hmm. just want to do a lot of things that are going to help you, yep, <laughs> essentially. Right, yeah. And so the hallmark of this game is there is a, a large um, menu in the middle where we're going to be selecting our actions because it is a worker placement game in the, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And Naveen just picked it up. He, he It was whim. his turn. He picked this yeah. up on a whim. It came with the Meeple Realty insert. Yeah, somebody is... was selling it. They said they, they had only played it once. They had decked it out. And I was like, all right, I'll take it. And so we got a really good deal on it. And um, yeah, after that, we played it and yeah. we fell in love with it. He picked it up and we were like, okay, well, we should play it or else that's kind of silly, right? Yep. And we absolutely fell in love with this game. So this is, uh, this is it's so fun. There's tiling. This is kind of like a mix of a lot of Uwe Rosenberg's games. And we will get into it more mm -hmm. when we get to, to to this game in the series and when we do the wrap up but uh for now this is a game i am definitely never ever getting rid of and I, I i would probably say the same about the expansion the norwegian expansion because yeah we really don't play the game without the expansion and we're probably going to do our playthrough with i it think we'll play well. yeah we'll do our playthrough on the channel with it uh it's one I of my favorite 
expansions. Yeah, the expansion is it's uh, it's like a one point five to it. It's like a it yeah, tweaks it and balances it, it better and just makes right? it better. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, that is my number two, a feast for Odin. Okay, well, here we are. We are down to the last one, for me at least, the one game that I would never, ever get rid of in our entire collection. This one came out back in 2004, so it's a fairly old game. It's definitely a Euro. Uh, it is published by Z-Man Games and designed by a gentleman by the name of Rudiger Dorn, and it is Goa. Goa, a new expedition specifically. This is the second uh, iteration of the game, this kind of the second edition. If you look it up on BGG, though, it's still under the same Goa title, so you, you might get a little confused there. Um, this one is interesting. It is a auction game. So the game is basically split up into two halves. Uh, at the first part of the game, you have an auction. And after that, then you go into kind of a multiplayer solitaire aspect of the game where you're trying to develop different tech, you're trying to build ships, um, you're trying to explore different uh, colonies, because ultimately what this game is loosely themed around is Portuguese colonists in the Goa region of India. Not really. <laughs> Uh, you're essentially just trying to push cubes and uh, develop your tech to score the most amount of points. Mm -hmm. The way you do that Very is hero. you build spice uh, plantations. You try to use that spice to then enhance different types of technologies. You build ships. You uh, recruit colonists so you can go and colonize different locations uh, so that you can gain more spices and then just kind of churn and burn. Uh, the interesting thing about the game for me, though, is the player interaction in the first half of every round where there's an auction mm -hmm. because it's a closed economy of money. So um, my money could potentially become Monique's money if uh, I'm bidding on something that she has put up for auction. And then I can kind of, you know, pass that money along to her. Now, she has more money to now buy other people's auction goods. Mm -hmm. But you can also buy from the bank and siphon money out of the economy which becomes very, very interesting in this game. So it's a little bit hard to conceptualize without actually seeing it, uh, but just know that there is a very fantastic auction aspect of the game, and then after the auction, everybody kind of just goes into their multiplayer solitaire, takes their three actions, and then you turn and burn for eight times. Which is interesting because uh, you find the auction to be the most interesting part of the game, I but do, the yeah. second half, which is that multiplayer solitaire, is the most important part of the it game. It is, yeah. It, it's, it's what you uh, do after you, the auction. It's where you score points, essentially, yeah. because everybody has their own player board that has sep different rows and different columns, and each column is a specific action type, yeah. like getting more money or uh, drawing cards. And so over the course of the game, you have the ability to upgrade these different action types by moving your cube down the column, and the further you go down the column, the sweeter that action type gets. Uh -huh. You get more money for the, for that one action, etc. But in order for you to to upgrade an action, you need to turn in a certain number of these resources. Yeah, spice the and spices. The yeah. spices, exactly. And you get those through the auction. And so that's kind of how everything comes together. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the game, you score points depending on where your cubes are on your player board. And so, yeah, it is quite dry. <laughs> it is, yeah. It is yeah. a dry euro all the way, but it's, it's really good. This is yeah. another one of the games. I think we, it was on a previous list of ours also Probably, on yeah. our channel because it's another one that we... Uh, another heavy game that we played when we were starting to get into the hobby. And I yeah. remember the feeling that my brain was sweating mm -hmm. after playing this at a, at a convention, and I think we finished it, and I had a headache, and I was <laughs> like, whoa, <laughs> what was that? That was that was like nothing I've ever experienced before. Yeah. Now, so. now looking back on it, it's not as heavy as we once thought it was, but it still gives me that same excitement, mm -hmm. and it still gives me that same brain kind of sweat. like brain sweat of like, how can I... How can I price my goods so that it 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 makes them have to make a tough decision? Right. So any decision that my opponent's going to make about mm -hmm. how I how I put this auctioned item out there is going to benefit me either way. Right. So it's all it, about putting the pressure on your opponents. Yeah. So so that's my number one of all time. Go Great on a new choice. expedition. Yeah. Okay, and finally. My number one is, uh, and now that I'm like down to my number one, I'm thinking about all the other games that I would have wanted to add to this list. Mm -hmm. And so just know that we didn't talk about our top most favorite games of all time, and those games we would also probably never get rid of. Yeah, sure. So this is a very hard list to make. But uh, my number one is a game that was designed or is designed by Stefan Feld, published by Z-Man Games in 2013, and is also getting a re print redesign re actually yeah. from a different publisher and it is Bruges. Bruges. so we talked about this game before 
Um, and I think we've spoken about it in a video where we said we were interested in the Cities Collection, mm -hmm. which is the new uh, redesigned version of this game, as well as an, a few of a few other Stefan Feld titles. Yeah, that's right. Macau, yeah. Rialto, and, and I can't remember the other one. We talked about it in the in the sense that we didn't have a copy of it. We wish we had one. It's out of print because it still is extremely out of print. Yes. This version of it. But uh, recently, we went to our local convention, and a, and a friend of ours was so nice to have found a copy of it yeah. and pick it up for us. So now we own it. He he knew we wanted a copy of it. I guess he saw it at a local store. It just happened to be there, and uh, it came along with the expansion. Mm -hmm. So he hit me up and was like, "Hey, I, there's a copy. I want the expansion. You want the base?" And I was like, "Yes, like yeah. just get it. Uh, I'll take it." Yes, and so this version of the game is the one that I the one that I played, I guess, mm -hmm. and I really, really, really enjoyed. I really enjoy this uh, Stefan Feld game because. It, it employs the use of multi-use cards, and I really like when games do that. Mm -hmm. It does it really well, and uh, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting game. I like it a lot. Um, it's not as punishing as other Feld games can right. be, but there is still that element of punishment. Mm -hmm. So you can't ignore certain things, and I know that I'm being very vague, but uh, I saw the artwork for the Cities Collection, and I'm sure that it's fine, and I, don't actually, I actually don't really know what, what it's going to was going to be included in that version of the game as opposed to this one, but I just really prefer the, the artwork of, of the, yeah, the look of the original. Um, this has that 2013 better. Euro kind of feel and look, which mm -hmm. is like home base for us. Yeah, you know? and for me, I'm real simple when it comes to board games. If I already have a copy of the original, I don't really need to replace it with a new version. Yeah. So even if there is an expansion that comes with it or, with it or something, this is still what I would probably end up keeping. Mm -hmm. You know, I did that once with Arboretum, and right. that, I'm never doing that again. So anyway, we are both really excited to have a, a copy of this in our collection, and we are never letting it go. Right. It is Bruges, the original version by Stefan Feld. All right, there you have it. Those are our top 10 slash 11 mm -hmm. games that we're never getting rid of, yeah. uh, which we keep on wanting to mention is not comprehensive. There are, you know, our top favorite games of all time we were also not going to be getting rid of in our collection, but yeah. it's so hard to make this list. And for that reason, we would love to hear what's on your list. That's right. So please let us know down below what you hold dear, you know, what what is uh, the most valuable in terms of what you determine is value, right, to mm -hmm. you for the board games in your collection that you would never want to get rid of. And once again, thank you to our Patreon community for voting on this particular topic. This was mm -hmm. fun to talk about. It, yeah. it really did make us kind of go through the collection and be like, what what are the games that we would want to keep yeah. you know, because of scarcity or because mm -hmm. we, for this just pure joy of the game? Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much for that. Also, if you are interested in that coffee company we talked about, that is Many Worlds Tavern. There is a link in the description below if you want to check it out. There is a 10% off for the first 100 people who use that code. Thank you all so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.